So thank you, um, everyone, for, for coming. Um, uh, I should mention before we get started that this, uh, it, it is being recorded this evening. So um, if you have something that you don't want recorded, uh, maybe don't say it. Um, so, and, and first, I want to say uh, thank you to, to the Berkman Center for, for sponsoring this event. Uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's something that um, I know is uh, happening uh, all over campus. Um, uh, thinking, good thinking about, about digital media, about learning, uh, and about what it means uh, for schools. And I know there are a lot of people here from, from all over, from um, public schools in the area, from the, from the ed school, um, from all over. So I, I'm, I'm really excited to have the conversation after, um, after the film. So, um, so I want to start by just saying a, a, a few words, and then we're just going to get, we're just going to get right into it. Um, I, I could say, in a, in a very blanket way, that, uh, that kids, kids learn differently online. Um, the web gives them unprecedented access to networks of people, places, and, and things. And online and increasingly offline, they can make, remake, and remix the culture around them. So tonight, we focus on the affordances of this new learning, putting aside for a moment the challenges of distraction, of violence, of social pressure, and, and other sorts of social ills so often associated with, uh, with young people and media. So we refocus the lens on kids inventing, making, and engaging the world around them. And we ask, is school enough? Can schools in their present form accommodate this new learning? And is that desirable? So tonight's program is in two parts. First, we'll watch a wonderful new documentary that explores the questions of what, when, and how kids learn, and informally, and with new forms. And then we'll have a discussion, led by a panel that features not only the uh, producer of the documentary, Steve Brown, but an esteemed group of people from the Berkman Center and some of the remarkable young people featured in the film. So I'll introduce our panel after the 50-minute uh, documentary, um, and we'll also have other people that um, uh, th that are nearby that, that I'll, I'll call on and, and ask for your input. It's not really going to be a panel discussion as much as it's going to be a discussion with everybody in the room. So please um, start thinking and, um, and let's, let's get this conversation going. So for now, please uh, sit back and relax and enjoy the 50-minute film. Um, well, I want to ask um, my panel, our panel, to, to come up here. Uh, again, just as a, the panel is more like a, uh, like a backboard, springboard, let's say to throw ideas at, um, and we'll see what happens. So, <clears throat> uh, so let me just introduce everybody very quickly. And we also have other people that I, I want to introduce as well. But um, if you can get on these strangely high chairs. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. I apologize for that. My name is Eric Gordon. I'm a fellow at the Berkeley Center this year. Um, and uh, so I'll introduce from, from uh, this side. This is uh, 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 Sandra Cortesi. She's a, um, the lead fellow of the um, Youth and Media Project at the Berkman Center. Um, Ray Yonko is sitting right next to her. Uh, he is a, a faculty associate at the Berkman Center uh, uh, this year as well. And Urs Gosser is the uh, executive director at the Berkman Center. So um, it's, it's great to have uh, those voices here on the panel. Um, and then we have Sierra Goldstein, who you all know, uh, who needs no introduction. Um, she's sitting on the panel. And then, and then Steve Brown, the director and producer of the documentary we just saw tonight. Those people are all sitting up here. And I'm going to ask of, of them, um, I'm going to ask them a few questions. But I also, before we start, I want to introduce also, on this side, we've got, uh, we have uh, Xavier and Monica and, and, and uh, Alex. I just want to. Also, we have Xavier over here, teacher Xavier over here, um, also. <laughs> so I want to start off the conversation tonight with, a, with just a simple provocation to the panel. And, uh, and, and I have each person say um, just, just a very, very quick response to this. And then I'll actually turn to you guys as well, if, you, if you're willing. But is school enough? Let's start with you, Steve. Well, I guess for me, it's more of a more than a rhetorical question, um, as you might be able to tell from the program. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I'm not sure it's its fault, but um, I think there's so much more um, that kids want to do and can do that should be included um, as part of of an education. And I think uh, opportunities there for for teachers and classrooms to include more of it um, relatively easily. 
Well, <laughs> I can tell you from my personal experience and from interacting with other kids in my community that a lot of the times it's not. Um, we want to be able to, as you know, youth go out there and make a difference and follow our dreams, which you know we're always told as kids you should follow your dreams. And in that situation, a lot of the time they get shot down, and you know that can be very, <laughs> very confusing. And so it's really nice to be able to you know go outside of those walls and you know try new things and figure out your passions and again personally from interacting with other kids it's been a lot more beneficial and empowering to do that than sitting in a classroom for eight hours thank you um Two quick remarks to start with. First of all, I've never been sitting so close to a movie star, which is amazing. <laughs> and secondly, I've never imagined a more formal setting to discuss informal learning. So I really hope we can open that up relatively quickly. Um, is cool enough? Um, my answer would be no, but I would add a, a, a provocation back uh, by saying, but schools are even more important than ever before. Um, and I think there are three reasons. Uh, the first reason was mentioned before and also stated nicely by Henry Jenkins in, in the documentary. There's a huge window of opportunity, I think, um, for schools to actually uh, build bridges to um, other contexts of learning, social and informal spaces of learning. Uh, and, and many teachers, and some of them actually in the room here, um, are doing already great work to, to improve uh, learning, to make learning more interest-driven, um, more community-oriented, more relevant. Uh, so I think it's worth later on to look quite closely at the different stories that we've seen, uh, because some of them, one could argue, happen actually at schools already. Uh, the second uh, quick remark is our observation along these lines. We have seen wonderful success stories in, in, in this documentary, uh, but of course we also know um, that there are challenges. We are dealing with digital divides and, and participation gaps along uh, socioeconomic inequalities across the country. Uh, and that is quite troublesome because uh, not everyone has um, uh, the kind of settings and support structures we've seen tonight. Even again, looking more closely at how many mentors and coaches you have seen here, uh, we, we shouldn't take that for granted, I guess. So there, there are challenges uh, as much as I, of course, love the narrative and, and also agree on the promise. Uh, and the third point, ultimately, why I think schools are more important than ever has to do with the basic literacies. Much of, I think, what we've seen here uh, happening, um, especially as far as the use of technology is concerned, also builds upon uh, the ability to read and write and, and express yourself. And some of these skills, obviously, uh, are, are deeply um, connect to school learning and, and will likely continue to be connected for a long time. So again, I think uh, school uh, continues to be extremely relevant. What we have is you know, a great opportunity to build from both sides and connect the learning indeed. I agree with a lot of what you said and I think that that last statement by Henry Jenkins was a great one about needing to connect what's happening outside of the classroom into the classroom and that learning should be connective, it, it should be a social process, it should uh, strive to be as engaging as possible and certainly uh, there, there are the issues of needing to, uh, to focus on, on basic skills but also focus on other skills uh, that, uh, that we might not consider basic, but that I might consider basic, like interpersonal skills and conflict resolution and how to work with people and how to collaborate and things like that. And when I say that, I don't mean that we need even more standards because that just kind of you know, makes me shiver a bit when we think about adding more standards. I, I think that, um, that the policy right now is, is pretty misguided in that there, um, there needs to be a lot of teaching to a test. And that, um, that one size fits all certainly uh, will, will reach that 68% in the middle, uh, but it doesn't really allow for, for the ones that, uh, for students who need something a little different. And I, I'm certainly in, in agreement there about the uh, particip participation gap in both engagement 
and in technology use. And I think that, that, and that's some of my research, that we need to focus on how students are, are using technology in the real world, meeting them where they are uh, in educational settings, and encouraging education through the use of newer technologies and not shying away from that, how we're currently doing in uh, K through 12. So uh, I think the, excuse me, I think the movie does a wonderful job at um, showing the different ways how you can support and excite students about the things they, in a way, uh, wanted to learn. Uh, I think one of the challenging questions is also how can you support schools, students, and teachers uh, to learn and teach the things that are maybe a little bit less fun to learn? And maybe going back to your provocation, um, one of the policy questions I think uh, could be how can students connect to school if it's such a controlled environment? Okay, great. Um, I want to see if there's anybody who wants to just jump in at this, at this moment to go out to the, to the audience right now to either respond to that question or, or, to, or to dig deeper into some of the, some of the issues that were um, brought up in the documentary. Yes. And the, and the, the, there's, a little, there's a microphone in the back, actually. You can press a little red button. Yeah. Sarah, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. I, I'm an elementary teacher. Mm -hmm. I have parents that do not understand letting their children go free mm -hmm. on the internet. And it's a real concern. How do you keep your child safe? How did you overcome that with your parents to let you reach beyond the norm and step outside those walls as you spoke of? Well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, you know, there was obviously there was a lot of trust involved because it can be very scary. I mean, as I've had many conversations with my parents, to let your kid, as you said, go out and sort of put themselves out there, especially in that digital social media world, and to try new things that necessarily haven't been done before. Um, and it really took a lot of, I would say, communication. Um, checking in with them, letting them know what I was doing, and having them be an active part of everything that I was doing. So it wasn't necessarily like, I was out there by myself doing these things. It was, yes, I was out there and I was putting myself out there, but my parents were with me. Um, they were, you know, my support system and they knew what I was doing and who I was talking to. So they were really a huge part of it. Um, and so they got to see firsthand what I was doing. And, you know, we would talk about it every night, what I was doing that day, what I wanted to do. So there was a lot of active and purposeful communication involved in that process. How did you find those initial resources to start that communication? What do you mean by resources? Well, how did you know where to go and look to start oh. sharing that information with your parents? Um, did you have a school mentor that said I, that there was resources well, out the, there? I was a part of the BU Innovation Lab, which is a okay. sort of program that allows kids to learn per passion. Okay. Um, and my parents were definitely an active part of talking with Monica, who we saw on the documentary about, um, you know, how this self-directed work, how this self-directed program worked, and um, you know, resources. I mean, yeah. So they were a huge part of how this, you know, self-directed program worked, and um, they were always you know, going to meetings with me, and they got to see, you know, firsthand everything I was doing from meeting with my mentors on Skype, you know, as you saw my mom was sitting right next to me, or, you know, going to coffee shops and meeting with my mentors. So they got to see all the educational steps I was taking, um, which really made them feel like they were even more of an active part of my education than they ever were when I was in school. Because when I was in school, you know, they would drop me off, have a great day, and then pick me up, and there wasn't much more after that. But with this, they really got to see, you know, what I was interested in, who I was talking to, and even the type of learning that works for me. So they could be like, you know, Sierra, I noticed that you're interested in this, and I've also noticed from being around you that you learn best this way, and here's how I can help you. So um, they were you know, just a complete active part of that. I wonder Thank if I you. can um, <clears throat> actually call in Sierra's mom, uh, who's sitting back there, to, to chime in on this, if there's anything you want to add. 
click that little red button on the. To the resource part, is that what you're trying to get to? Um, I would say one of our mentors, too, was uh, from a company called Room 214. And he taught Sierra a lot about social media, um, creating those uh, Twitter accounts. Um, she worked with Malika Chopra a lot about the blogging and, and blogs with intent. So it was a learning process. Um, how, how did we initiate that conversation was a communication every day. There wasn't a one single defining moment. It was conversation every day and learning every day together, um, which really pushed us into, um, well, participating in her life. On, on And it's a gift, actually, uh, that we've been able to do that. So there was no defining resource out there except for we looked out into the community and connected with geniuses in that community that can then help us um, create this learning experience. Does that help? Okay. So, uh, so it, it, it seems like in one of the things that you said, Sierra, uh, which is that um, your, your parents became more involved in your life um, after, when it was no longer just dropping you off at school. And, and that, that's just a, a nice way to, to frame it. And I, and I wonder if we, it, you know, if we could talk a little bit about that, um, that kind of formal versus informal tension um, that, that we have here. And, and in some ways, a lot of what we were talking, a lot of what we, was featured in this, uh, in this film um, are, are distractions. Traditionally, we would, we would call them distractions. They're, they, they come, they're, they're apart from the, the goals of, of, uh, of traditional education. And so, how do those distractions get sort of recentered? How do, how do they, or how do they become the center? Um, in your education, it was it seems extraordinary in the way that it happened. But I wonder if we can talk more broadly about about what the practicalities are of taking those things traditionally understood as distractions and then bringing them in to the to the uh, um, this sort of structure of, of education. I don't know if anybody on the panel has anything to say about that, or anybody else. I'll comment. I mean, I, I actually wouldn't necessarily describe the things that we saw as distractions, although I understand why you, why you would. The, um, <clears throat> the thing that we were trying to do in all of our stories, and I mean, as I'm sure you can tell already, the, it's not really about the individual story as a success story that we're really trying to tell. It's really about how that story represents something bigger than that. In Sierra, Sierra's case, it's about how she's resourced the community and <clears throat> both on and offline to figure out what she wants to do, to learn about what she do, she's, to learn about what she wants to do. She's really expanding her knowledge base to all this, un, all these untapped resources that are both online and offline. But the um, to the issue of distraction, I mean, the the other thing that we wanted to do is to show stories of kids doing really important work, which I think is often too often lacking in the classroom. I mean, they're asked to do work certainly. Um, but are they asked to do things that are important to um, people other than the classmates or the teacher? Are they asked to do things that are important to their community and so forth? So I guess I, I, would, I would say that, that you know, our, 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 our uh, the important, most important thing for us to tell was the, that the, the, all these kids were helping bring an elephant to Maine, which, you know, we all want an elephant in our hometown, I know. Um, especially when it's only 1,000 people. Um, you know, they participated in, in this, this big discussion about what to do, what, what, you know, what the problems are in public schooling in Boston, for example, and how to fix those. Um, um, you know, the, the, how to make Warner Brothers um, use fair trade chocolate and so forth. So those aren't really distractions in the same way that, say, you know, using te you know, text messaging or Facebooking or whatever, you, you know, whatever kids are doing and so forth are distractions in the way that we view them that way. These are actually important things, more, more than just distractions. I didn't mean to veer your question off course there, Eric. Oh, that's but great. Thank you. Uh, Ray, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, you know I do. Uh, the whole idea about Facebook and, and social media is distractions, I guess I, I rile against in, in, in just not, pers not only personally, but in my research, that uh, we find that there are some great ways that we can use these tools in education. And, and what you mentioned, before about how do you convince your parents? I think I think this is a larger kind of societal problem that that we've somehow agreed that social technologies are time wasters at best, 
and very evil or dangerous places at worst. And um, I think the media is also to blame for this because you get a lot of media hype about, you know, here's, let me show you what's bad, what's bad, and what's bad. And I think that if I could summarize my research in one sentence, it would be that it's not about whether or not youth or students are using social technologies, it's about what they're doing on those social technologies. So for instance, some of my research findings show that if, uh, if kids are playing games on Facebook, right, uh, Farmville, I'm so happy to have um, uh, research results that show that Farmville and Mafia Wars are bad for you uh, b because, you know, I always hated them polluting my stream and Facebook anyway. But, but, <laughs> but the point is that, that games like that actually have uh, a, a negative effect on, on learning and a negative effect, uh, effect on engagement, whereas things like checking in to see what your friends are doing, what, what kids call Facebook stalking or Facebook creeping, actually has a more positive effect. And we've also shown in experimental studies how you can integrate things like Twitter uh, to, uh, to get more positive learning outcomes. And, and Eric has done some of this work too. You, he's got a paper with some of the uh, technology they developed for, for their classroom. And so uh, I really rile against that idea that social technologies are, are er, bad. I think we need to figure out some ways to integrate them very effectively in education. Well, I think it's, it's interesting that um, in, you know, in, in, in our experience with, with uh, Community Planet, um, what became clear is we ran into some barriers, as we always do whenever we, um, we use um, Community Planet and school systems, um, which is that the most social media is, is blocked. And, um, and so we couldn't get onto YouTube and, and we couldn't get onto Facebook um, and to do the things that we needed to do. And, and these guys um, got around it with a little help from their, uh, from their teacher, but uh, they, show, yeah. they show, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but it was amazing to watch. It was like the, what they did was they were, they were producing amazing things. They needed access to, uh, to YouTube in order to, in order to do it. Um, and and they, they did it in school. And, and it's those kinds of, uh, that kind of learning that was going on because of social media are those, are those examples of real product, productive um, learning experiences where sort of, um, uh, sort of sledgehammer policies of, of uh, just blocking social media is not necessarily uh, the best way to go. So I don't know if you guys want to yeah, chime in, please. Um, I'm Alex Jesus. Um, <clears throat> I, I had a statement about um, you guys talking about how to control students, uh, how like standards and things like that. But I feel that 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 is true. But that is for people who who know what they want. Like I don't know what I want. So for me to for if my school was more geared for those who wanna you know express themselves freely and things like that, I feel like that's great because. Um, when you have a standard, you're killing the potential. You're killing what the kids could could have, could have been if they would have chased their dream. But then again, you put you put me in a position where I was forced to be in this class when I first started. But then I realized I love you know media. So, but when I follow the standards and the guides, I feel like you know that that isn't always the worst thing. I feel like we're we're talking a lot about people that know what they want and. We're not talking enough about people who don't want, who don't know what they want. The average guy, the average person who's applying to college and is going undecided, or who doesn't want to go to college because maybe they're scared. I feel like, uh, I feel like it's we should always encourage kids to do what they want and you know and have the ability to to chase their dream. But also we should also you know be able to give the kids who don't know what they want uh, guidance and also meet mentors and try things. I feel like we should be focusing a lot on that. Um, if you, I'd like to add something to that. Um, something that I've learned from doing this lab and something that I love that you said was the, um, experiment. And I think that you know when kids don't know what they want to do, they need the freedom to experiment with different things. And you can't, you're, you know, you're not brought into life knowing exactly what you want to do. It takes life experiences and you know trying out different things to realize what your main passion is and then once you have that you can go out and you can find mentors and people that are doing those things that can help support you and you can have people to help support you through that experimentation process so you know I see sort of a like I said in the documentary a network of people who are you know giving you ideas of things to try or if you have an inch you know, or you can go and try that thing and then you might not like it but then you might love it, and then that's your passion, and then you can do that. 
and um, you know setting that standard doesn't allow kids to go out and do that and you know I feel that's very disempowering and so I just I loved that you said experimentation and that just is so so true to be able to figure out what you want to do yes I'm curious what you think about the future of people making connections online where they never met that person before because it seems to me like the more technology gets into our personal lives, the less people are comfortable just striking up conversations like people usually used to do more often. And I'm curious, like, are people going to start meeting each other for the first time based on Twitter, based on Facebook? based on Skype or whatever, and how do you see that playing out in the next five years? Well, the assumption that people aren't striking up conversations anymore is not upheld in any of the research. So the research absolutely shows that people who are communicating online are also communicating offline. Uh, the idea of meeting strangers uh, doesn't tend to happen that much either. Again, the research shows that people who you're connecting with online are people who you have some kind of tie to. Uh, the, the research calls those uh, like the strong or the weak ties. Um, and, um, and so in the future, are people going to meet more and connect more online? I would think so. I mean, I think, I think that happens now for me professionally. I meet people, they'll, they'll see my blog or they'll, you know, uh, find me on Twitter and they'll say something uh, about me or to me. Uh, or about some of my work, and, and then we'll end up meeting at a conference or at, or at some kind of forum like this. So, um, so I, I think that we'll probably see about the same. Maybe if we're, you know, kind of extending out 30, 40 years when we have implants and, you know, we can access the internet by kind of blinking, maybe that might be different. But I don't think that's going to substantially change all that much in the near future. So uh, one thing to add maybe to that, I also think that there is a big value in maybe having the, those mentors or people online and not necessarily even meeting them offline. So as throughout the movie, you see a couple of times where online mentors played a big role. Uh, and that's, for example, something how we could think about scaling mentorship uh, could be a potential in there, I think. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to speak to the issue of using social media for, for learning because um, while I really appreciated the examples that were given in the film, they're kind of cherry picked and the average student isn't going to start their own business necessarily or their own video recording company and I'm kind of thinking about the comment made by the Boston English student here across the room of how about the child that's trying to find themselves and uh, just as an anecdotal reference, I have a child who's being home educated for high school and she's doing her education online. Um, using MIT's open sourceware, and she's taking some classes at Harvard Extension, and she's really used Facebook to help her define her career goals. Um, she found she wants to study uh, neurobiology, and she found a Facebook site in Australia, um, Body and Mind, another one called um, Neuro Orthopedic Institute, and then there's another institute in London, and she reads online articles that are published for free. She could never do this at the public high school in our town. And so I think, I mean, as we're looking at is school enough, I think we're looking at ways to augment what school does, not necessarily replace it. But I'm particularly interested in bringing this back to the discussion of the panel up front. How does one find the mentors that one needs to help direct this, ed this educational process? So I, if um, anybody who wants to speak to it, especially I suppose Sierra, because she's done this, but um, I'm open to who, whatever anybody has to contribute. Thank you. I'd just like to give one example, actually. Um, sorry, I mean to all of this. The, we worked on a, an additional story of this this girl, she's 14, named Catherine, um, who lives in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And her, she had this idea at 14 that she wanted a Pontiac Fiero, which I don't know if anybody knows what those are, but they were around for four years, and the first year they burned most of the time. They caught on fire. <laughs> but they're very sporty, two-seater. And she wanted a Pontiac Fiero, so she bought one for $450. And she's now, with her father, rebuilding this car. And so she's got the engine spread out in the basement. And, the chassis out in her uncle's garage and so forth. But she created this forum on the, there's a Fiero forum, of course, 
um, more than one. Um, she created this forum where basically she's been sort of crowdsourcing um, the resources that she needs to rebuild this car. And like that's a, you know, that's a very simple and direct way of saying that if you're, if you're interested in something, there are thousands of people out there who are also interested in it and are more than willing to give you help in all sorts of ways about all sorts of arcane subjects like Pontiac Fieros. So, I mean, that's a, and that's totally tied to learning. And that's a, believe me, it's a big project that she's taking on. Um, she's welding, she's rebuilding the engine, she's doing all kinds of stuff. And she's online. Did she get some mentors for that? Her, her mentors are untapped resources all over the world. I mean, people in Australia, people all over the country are saying to her, I know what to do about that particular problem. So they're finding her and then they're contacting her yeah, or they, they're finding they talk her website. In the, yeah, they talk in the, in the forum. And she's become known on the Fiero website because she's doing this extraordinary thing and she's 14 and so forth. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's like that. No, you're fine. Um, you know, you asked how, because I've done this, how I found my mentors online through social media. And, you know, to me, social media is really just a big web for all of us to connect. And there's so many different avenues with the blogging, and there's YouTube, and Twitter, and Facebook, all these different things where all these people are putting out information. And what I really did is I went out and looked for the information that I was interested in. So say, um, yoga, for example. So I would go and I would search, you know, yoga hashtags on Twitter and, um, you know, yoga teachers on Google and I would find these people and I would start following them religiously, you know, retweeting them, following their blogs, commenting, and eventually, you know, you make enough of an impression that they start contacting you back. And then you start creating those relationships and through those relationships, mentoring naturally happens. And so I found a lot of my mentors from following their information, putting out my own information and, you know, tweeting it to them saying, hey, here's my blog, you know, I really think we could connect, read it and tell me what you think. Um, and because of that, I've met some, you know, amazing mentors that have completely changed my life and I've been able to, you know, create a bigger voice. Um, I'm actually a frequent blogger on Malika Chopra's intent.com, which has helped me connect with numerous people because it's such a big website. So, you know, using social media to find mentors is actually quite easy and natural when you're putting out information and then searching for information that means something to you. So it's, it's fairly easy and it's amazing the people you can meet from all around the world and you know again because of social media you can connect with them every day you know over Skype and you have 24-7 support and it's you know an amazing feeling to have that many people by your side and then you're learning and gaining new information all day every day to put into your education and into your life to move forward. I want to go back to something that Alex said though earlier is that is this really a, is this really a, a, a dichotomy between um, uh, between structured and, and unstructured is that really the, the, the problem here because I, I hear what you're saying that it's it, that if you if you know what you want, then, then the web is, is fabulous because you can just follow your dreams and, you can, and you, can, you can get it. But if you don't, then you need that structure. And I hear that, that from, from your comment. And, and, I, um, and I don't want to go down the path in this, in this conversation to say that it's, a, it's an either or choice. And I don't think that's what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, yes? Well, related to that, um, I think there's a question about equality and access. A question about equality and access, and that's a question I think for the panelists and maybe you know other people in the room, is you know what if people don't really have time out of school to explore what they want to do? What if they're working 20 plus hours a week, or you know helping their parents, or maybe they have a single parent at home? Um, what if they don't have the structures to, you know, even have adult mentors to talk to? So how do they get started? And how do, you know, how do they actually have a fair shot at some of these um, wonderful online resources and mentors? So I was uh, noticing the co-founders of Big Picture Learning, uh, Dennis uh, Licky and Elliot Washer, and I've worked with Big Picture. There's about a network of 50 schools all around the country. And I think to the question of finding mentors, it, it might be a question of reimagining the purpose of school. 
Um, in, in big picture learning schools, the job of the school is to help students identify their passions and interests and then connect them to mentors. Um, and then I, I think there is still a strong place for the school because when each of those students are then going out and exploring their, their interests and passions and then coming back together, there's a kind of cross-pollination and also a mix of, I mean, we definitely leverage the, the online um, resources, but certainly by connecting it tightly to local community issues, uh, we also develop those tight connections. Um, so I, I'm really intrigued by this conversation, but I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm also thinking about the question of like, it's not just outside of school, like there's the opportunity to really fundamentally redesign the purpose of school um, to answer and really, I think, address a lot of these, these uh, issues. I think that exactly what you're saying is um, completely correct. I think that one of the first places you really have to start looking for mentors, like you're saying, is in the schooling environment. The first place that you have to be looking for mentors are your teachers. I'm really interested in history. I'm really interested in doing this. I'm really interested in media. I want to make a video. Okay, let me go to the guy who does the media at my school. Let me talk to him. And just like you're saying, okay, I need guidance to do my passion. What am I passionate about? I have no idea. So it's about how can the school environment really funnel you into a position where you can get exposed to everything, where you can be working with every single teacher closely, and you can be saying, okay, what am I really interested in? And then you can be going to that teacher, and that's how you can really explore your passion. And you can be making videos, you can be doing music videos, and you can be doing things like that, but you can actually be able to do it in school. And then, you know, like was mentioned over here, my girlfriend works 40 hours a week and she's in high school. She doesn't have time to do anything out of school, but it's about how can she actually be in school, really connect with her teachers, have those online resources in school, and exactly how can she redefine the purpose of school. And by the time she goes to college, she says, okay, I know this is exactly what I want to do because high school prepared me for life and high school prepared me to really find out, you know, who I want to be and what I want to do. And I just want to address the, the question about mentors. Um, I'm a recent high school graduate, and um, about two years ago, I started working on a book on education, and I was just really passionate about it because I was feeling frustrated in my school setting, and I didn't really know where to start. I just started researching on the internet, looking at archives of basically every major newspaper, and then what I realized was that everybody in the world is is connected by each other basically by an email, and you can connect with some of the most um, most prestigious and most famous people in the world if you just know their email address. And what I did, I just started guessing emails, finding emails on faculty <laughs> web pages. And I'd, uh, what I, it's funny because what would happen is that people would email me back saying, how did you find my email? It's not public. And it would be a pretty awkward conversation. But <laughs> what would happen was that um, after some time when I was doing my interviews for my book, and what I was realizing was that people wanted, in my situation, I, I'm a young person, people really want to talk to young people, and they really have a, a really motivation and a desire to do so. Um, and one tangent to that, when I was talking with somebody like Secretary Arne Duncan, he can't really criticize me publicly because I'm a student. Um, it, it would look pretty bad on his um, account. So I think what's important to look at is um, finding mentors, it's, it's about building that relationship. On Twitter, I've made so many different friends basically by participating in, in weekly ch Twitter chats. So in education specifically, there's a chat every night, um, maybe it's on social studies or on history or on reimagining school. There are all these different communities that you could be a part of, um, and I think Twitter is probably one of the best communities to look to uh, because it's not like Facebook where you have to have access or you have to friend request somebody. Twitter, it's open uh, on the web. Um, and addressing the, the point about reimagining school, I think we have to realize that um, we have to think about reinventing school from scratch. I mean, there are some really amazing schools around the country, big picture. Uh, there's a school called the Brightwork School by Gebert Tully in, in San Francisco. And I think what these schools all have in common is that first, the curriculum is based on something called a city's a school model, where they're using the resources in the community, uh, in the city, um, and they're kind of bring, bringing it back to the actual classroom. And I think we have to realize the classroom isn't that cinder block, um, Destin Rose, um, chalkboard or blackboard, it's, it's really the world. And once we start reimagining that and thinking about the classroom as your, the real world in your cities and communities, that's when we really make the difference in education. What's your book called? One Size Does Not Fit All, A Student's Assessment of School.
I'd like to go back to to Sorry. your comment about the the resources in school and for and or re, people that don't have enough resources. And I think that that's one of my major concerns when I talk about the 68 percent, right? I, I I really am concerned about those not at not beyond the 68, you know that line, but lower than that. And I'm I think that um, we're in an unfortunate situation where kids who don't have the resources to engage in these kinds of things on their own are also, and, and when I talk about resources, I don't just mean money, I mean psychological resources, emotional resources, uh, support, peer, peer support, but also familial support. They also happen to be in school districts or systems or schools that don't have enough resources to support them. So right, we're talking about these great programs, but they're really not generally getting to the students that need them most. So one of the things, I mean, you know, this is, I guess, my wonky research side is that I would like to see is as we're, we're, um, we're uh, implementing these interventions that we're also measuring how effective they are for all students, not just your most motivated students and, and you know, maybe even not your most, your least motivated students, but for everybody. And to say, to be able to come up with some ideas about like, okay, this kind of intervention is going to work well most generally here, but then th how do we individualize that to the students who might need you know, a little more because of these lack of resources. And I think that's, that's one of the key problems that we're, we're focusing so much on what the kind of baseline is and the conversation has been about failing schools and about testing and we're not really asking about how we're failing the youth. And uh, so one question also related to mentors. I feel like we are talking here about mentors as being some kind of superstar and adult. Mm -hmm. um, so also to put it out on the table, no, what's I, I, the first place I would actually go and start for within the school is my peers. No, the student that is one <laughs> class above you could be exactly as good as a mentor as your teacher, depending on what you would like to learn. And some, for example, one thing that we do at uh, the Youth and Media Lab is work with students over a period of time, and then they go out and they serve as mentors. So not to put Gabby here on a bad spot, uh, but it's exactly students like her and uh, the friends she came with that I think play a big role in how you can be a mentor and support other friends and peers. So only if you want to say something, you can say something. So, hi, I'm Gabby. These are my friends who are from a high school um, in northern Massachusetts. And one thing I did learn working with Youth and Media Lab is that peer-to-peer -peer mentorships are so critical because they spread mentorships among a much wider range of students. No longer do you have to be with an adult to necessarily receive advice. You can receive it from a trained peer who can train you to um, also reach out to just communities that wouldn't be accessible before. Something to sort of add to that, um, you know, that 20% rule and finding your passions. Um, I would think that would make school even more of, you know, a tool for youth is if we would be able to have the time to sort of, you know, do what I'm doing all day um, in that short amount of time. So you can go and you can experiment with different things with your friends and figure out what you like and then you know, I always find something very interesting is that all these amazing speakers often go to venues where there's not a large 
community that can go and see them. So not everybody can go and see them. And if we could bring those people you know, to the schools for all the kids to see, all the communities to see, they would be able to make those connections and you know, maybe figure out what they wanted to do while still you know, staying in that school environment the 80% of the time, if that's what we needed to do as a first step. I think that would be really important. In the back. Um, we, we've listened to these great stories about these great ideas and these great individual cases of change and big new ideas for reinventing the classroom, like we said. But unfortunately, as a teacher, we also see every year more and more focus on tighter and tighter standards and rote test scores. And I, I wonder if, especially on the research end, is there a way that is there a hope that we can communicate these successes to the people that are in charge of, you know, guiding us, our departments of education, especially at a, a national level? Because it seems like these people are so removed from these great cases and this, these data, uh, the research that you do, how can we make them connect, you know? You know, my, my reaction to that is a strong gut reaction is how the hell did we get here? Great, thanks. Um, I just want to respond a little bit. Um, I'm just going to uh, politely push back on the standard bashing. Um, I'm a principal of an urban charter school, and uh, so we're in a really low performing district, a level four district in Massachusetts, where everyday kids are showing up and they're not learning. And so, um, we need to consider the other perspective, which is that not all kids are empowered by their families, by their communities, by their schools, um, to be able to learn even the most basic skills, as Orr said earlier, reading and writing that are fundamental to practicing some of these other um, higher skills. Uh, Alex, thank you. You also said standards are important. Um, not all students are ready to follow their passions. Not all students know what they are. Um, so we're, again, an urban charter school. Our students are doing really well, um, tremendously outperforming the district. And we do believe that it's very important that our kids learn standards. The new standards, the Common Core standards, actually are really um, pretty high order thinking skills. The math has a lot of modeling, a lot of application. The reading and writing is high level. So just uh, defensive standards, but also we have a program where we've really structured over grades six to 12, our kids um, learning how to identify issues in the community that they care about and then act on them. And we have our 12th graders then are doing, uh, acting on research papers they've written in 11th grade and they can choose their project and go out and what do they wanna do in the world. And many of them are still uh, have a real hard time with that and they don't know. Well, there are so many things out in the world. What would I want to pursue? Um, so I don't think schools are enough. We couldn't ever possibly be enough for everyone, but, um, but it's just a matter of tinkering towards that and continuing to use the great stories and models that we have. Right now we're engaging in Eric's game, most of our students um, in Salem trying to help improve our community through Community Planet. Um, but you know, you, you get each kid with something different, um, but teach them how to read, write, think, and do basic calculations, and they have a better shot at pursuing their dreams as well. Thank you. Just uh, to your question, thanks, Rachel. I think that puts things very much into perspective. Um, back to your question. So how, how do researchers communicate about these findings or anecdotal evidence or increasingly also you know, quantitative studies? I think on the one hand side, we definitely see a shift on the research side that we are more networked as well. The researchers are more networked. We are um, you know, using the same tools, of course, to, to share knowledge and to collect the stories and, and to tell each other kind of the stories and learnings from our work and meet the conferences. But, but there is the other thing, and, and I know there are a number of people from the ed school in the room that I would like to hear from, from whoever you are and wherever you sit, uh, what's happening on the education side at the, at the schools of education? Uh, uh, what, what's happening there in terms of uh, you know, balancing and mitigating these tensions between, well, it's more standardized on the one hand side, but then 
you know, we agree on the potential of informal learning and more experimental approaches and the like. How do you teach that to your students, uh, the future teachers? Who's, who's here from the ed school? Who's a instructor at the ed school? Um, yeah, so we're working on it. <laughs> but I, but I, I, I wanted to particularly say in response to your question that there, and it was like, it's, it's Nikhil, is that right? Yeah. So I have an email. I work for someone called the Innovation Unit as well as being at the ed school. And um, we work with a couple of US states with system leaders of the state. And I was CC'd into an email of a bunch of them sharing your book with each other. So they are listening and they're very conscious of the way that the kind of ecosystem of education is changing. And they're all very worried about you know where their systems fit into all of that and, and how schools need to change to kind of um, adapt to this, to this new environment. Um, but I think it, you know, that there is always the question of kind of how do you ensure equity, and um, there's a there's a big problem about how you kind of create the freedom that can allow students to follow passions and take advantage of the great things that are out there, while making sure that you're still, you know, getting everybody to the point where they have the foundational skills to engage in that. Um, so I think the idea of like the 20% kind of thing is is fantastic because that's a really practical kind of thing that can ensure. It's you know one way of getting balance, but I wonder if, if any of you had other kind of thoughts or ideas about sort of, um, of ways to to change accountability so that you're kind of uh, striking striking maybe a different kind of balance than the one we have now. Um, and I, I actually wanted to qualify. Uh, you mentioned about the standards bashing. I want to qualify my own standards bashing. That it's it's not a bashing of the standards themselves but it's a bashing of how we have chosen as a society to evaluate those standards. So the standardization of, of evaluation and then, and then needing to kind of meet those, you know, those goals to get somewhere, right? I, I was, I'd spoken to, to some on the panel about this. In our school district, they have something called enrichment time, which is their 20%. And my friends were talking about enrichment time and enrichment time, and I said, what is, it, what is enrichment time? What does that mean? And they said, well, that's the time when the teachers aren't teaching to the test. I thought, wow. <laughs> so I, I think that's where, where my, I guess, uh, rub is with the standards, that we've gotten to a place, of course, I think that critical thinking skills are important, and, and reading and writing and math and, and higher order uh, kinds of skills are important. I also think there are others that are very important that we're not focusing on either, like interpersonal skills and collaboration and, and social learning and those kinds of things. So. Can I um, just bounce it over to Xavier or, oh, sorry, Alex. I, but I wanted to hear from you too. We only have a few minutes left and I thought I'd bring you in as a, another teacher voice and go ahead, Alex. Uh, what I was gonna say was, um, I, I understand like the whole standard thing, but I feel like if you're gonna give students like me a standard, please make it like, not perfect, but as, best as you can because I'm in an AP class and we don't have enough books. So you're giving us a standard but it's hard to follow because of the fact that okay now I'm just have to go print out pieces of paper that I have to now take home and bring back and so I, I believe that if you're gonna give give the, the you know the public students a standard please uh, you know, like give it give it top quality as you know as best as we can. And also about like the kids doing freedom, like trying to do their own thing. Uh, I believe that uh, at the school opportunities are always there because I mean I debate for two years and that's at the school and that's my own time and but that's something that I really enjoy and I then I, I take an urban improv class which is like something that I really enjoy and I really enjoyed it and I do it after school and a lot of kids are really against that because that's their own time whether well, that means you're not really interested in that subject because if you're really interested in that subject you would take any opportunity that the school gives you. So I feel like a lot of times the school does give you the opportunity. If the kids are nervous or scared or, or like, uh, I feel like new environment brings out the fear in a lot of kids and then they want to sh uh, shelter up and not be themselves. Um. On the standards front, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there's, uh, I, I'm at the English high school, a lot of eyes are on us. Um, there is no way I would have been able to do what we did um, with Community Planet today. There's really? no way. Mm -mm. It would. They literally would have been um, they, timed agendas. I have a five minute, do now, move on, mini lecture, move on, demo, move on, independent work time. And then you get a, a write up that says your transition from your mini lecture into reflection took three minutes too long kidding me you know and we're talking about diversification and we need to teach all the students but yet 
if something takes too long, or if something wasn't, you know, you know as a teacher, when you're looking at a child's face, either there's frustration, anger, boredom, or I'm digging this, you have to be ready to go on the fly and figure out, you know, I'm gonna work that, I'm gonna work that into the next thing. And the, the young, I'm one of 11 teachers that are tenured, the rest are all provisional um, at our school because most people either were fired or, or jumped ship. They are, they're doing what they're told. And they're not, they're the, the craft, the magic, the pain that, you know, that I went through the, for the first few years, they're not, they're, they don't, they're not getting that experience. And, um, and that's unfortunate because I think, you know, now I'm in my 10th year, I'm, I'm hitting my stride. I'm starting to, I feel like I am an educator now. You know, before I was kind of, I'm, I'm working this thing the best I can and I'm not winning, but I'm, I'm trying hard, you know, and now I can go to bed at night knowing that. Um, yeah, and one last note on the, um, on the mentor piece. Um, Kevin, right there, Kevin was a mentor for Xavier, and I think you're what, like two years different in age? 19 and 21, and I think, you know, and that, that was a success story. I mean, was it for you, X? And I think that's what happens a lot, you know, when we asked, is school enough? I think um, I went to some of the best schools that money can buy, and I hated them. I hated school. It was one of those things, like, I, the bus would be pulling up. I got I to gotta go back home. I got to go to the bathroom. You know, like, anything I could do to miss the bus would be fantastic. Um, but I look at our, you know, at English high school, yeah, we're a tough school. Um, we don't have all, you know, all of our ducks in a row. But... For a lot of our kids, this is the one place that they can go where there is, it's safe. You know, they have a computer. There isn't, you know, we don't have, um, in these communities, we're one of the only, you know, uh, segments that you didn't go into the kids' houses and, and walk their streets. Um, so is school enough for learning? No, but is it, a, is it a, for you guys, is it a good place? It is? Loaded question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is. I mean, I'll, but I mean, I look at these guys in particular. They're they're always hanging around and they're always with their friends. Like, and I know in the back of their mind, as as they're watching all this, they're like, "Wow, do these people have friends? Like, why are they on the internet and stuff?" You know, they really are. Their their peers are their support group. And then occasionally you get somebody like Alan, Michael, myself that takes an interest and says, "There's something else here, man. You know, let's let's milk this." And, and they respond, but it's it's ultimately about choice, and uh, and and heart. Thank you. Um, we are. It's eight o'clock, and I and I want to just um, we're going to have to wrap up, and hopefully there there can be conversation afterwards. But I want to give our panel just uh, a, just an, the the last word here. If if uh, if if you have something to say, you want to kind of jump in. Should we pull Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Um, maybe ironic. I mean, this may, may seem ironic that I, I would take a position on standards, the one I'm about to take. Um, I think the, the case to, make, to be made is that um, I mean, we were kind of careful not to be um, too, too critical of schools per se. I mean, we were kind of critical of what was included in, in, in educational discourse, but we, but we weren't really critical of schools per se because we realized that there are lots of issues that are hugely complex that are very difficult to, um, to fix easily. But one of the things that I think is an entry point for, um, for being more inclusive of what kids are interested in is to sort of take the standards and then think about what the ecosystem is around those standards. And um, if, for example, you took Community Planet, as may be the case in the charter school in Salem, for example, or you were to take Project Noah, which was an elephant story, or you were to take Harry Potter Alliance, for example, and turn that into an educational curriculum and tie it to the standards specifically, you'd go a little ways in trying to um, reach kids. 
in a way that they understood. You know, whether it was because it was a game or because it was, um, you know, getting an elephant to come to your town, or, or it was that it was based on The Hunger Games or another popular form of, of, of young person's fiction. So I think that thinking about this that way, I think, would be productive and would also keep the conversation, you know, open about the standards, which we realize need to exist, but also broaden the conversation so that it was broadened in the direction of kids and the things that they're interested in. And I think if you were to do that, you'd, get it, you'd have it both ways in some ways. And that's, the, that's, that's what I would like to, to see, actually, is to think about that ecosystem becoming part of the standards itself. Again, sort of adding on to what Steve said about the standards, I know, I think that kids reach standards in different ways. And for us to set up a system or set up that space for those kids to reach those standards in the way that works best for them would be you know, the best use of everybody's time. And it would be more beneficial to the students, to the teachers, and to the world if those kids were allowed to you know, prove themselves and reach those standards by doing something that really meant something to them. And then they would be more motivated to reach those standards if that's you know, one of their goals and aspirations. Um, and sort of a thought-provoking question <laughs> that I like to think of is you know what would happen if we gave kids the space to experiment with different things and find their passion and then once they did that allowing them the space to find mentors whether it's in their peer, with their peers whether it's online whether it's you know riding your bike to the dentist's office and meeting with the dentist cuz you want to be a dentist and then allowing them to experiment with that just in time learning like what would happen with those kids, how would education change, and how would the world change? Well, I think the changes we've seen today in the documentary and the, the fundamental transformations uh, in the learning ecosystem and teaching ecosystem, they are happening. Uh, that's not the question. That's, uh, we, you know, it's work in progress. Um, and, and I think that the bigger question is, is how smart are we about opportunity? Uh, that, that we've seen today, that we have discussed today, but also how do we address some of the challenges uh, where we didn't find good answers uh, regarding the question uh, you know, of participation gaps or, or less privileged community members and, and the like. Uh, these are certainly two things we need to work on, both uh, bottom-up by experimentation, I'm very much in favor of that, but uh, some of the comments have suggested, perhaps increasingly also top-down, really having policy conversations uh, around these topics. And I'm encouraged by the event today, but also by much of, of the work uh, that we've seen over the past few years in, in ICT and with education in particular, um, that, that we will make progress. It's, a, it's an evolutionary process, so it will take uh, more work and, and more um, resources, but uh, I'm, I'm an optimist and I think we'll improve our learning ecosystem both as far as educational institutions are concerned, but also opportunities um, for information, um, informal learning. Yep. And I, I guess it comes as a surprise to me that I'm an optimist as well. Um, I'm not surprised. You're not. No, we that's, knew. that's good. That's nice because sometimes I think I'm a realist, and everybody calls a realist a pessimist. So um, I, I think I am an optimist, and I agree that that I think I think there there have to be some positive changes coming, and that there there's so many movements abound that um, that um, are focusing on changing schools and on uh, integrating new ways and new ideas for standards, new ways of teaching and new ideas for standards. And I think that that's one of the conversations that I hope that we'll have uh, as a society um, soon about what else are we wanting our kids to take away from school. We, th we think about like individual kinds of, of social problems as being caused by by one variable, and I, I don't think that way. I think that there that you know social ills are caused by many variables and complex interactions between variables, and there there's really only one way to kind of deal with that, and that's through education. And I believe our educational system can and will get us there. Um, 
I think, uh, at least for me personally, I will continue to really work hard on thinking a way about ways how to include technology in the classroom mm -hmm. and how to help this uh, shift into a positive direction for the students especially. And I wanted to thank especially the students that came out here today. Uh, it's those events and your comments where I learn and where I grow. And so thank you for coming out. Uh, and, and I just want to thank you for coming out. Uh, it's been a great conversation and, and uh, maybe a round of applause for both our panel and yourself. <laughs>